All right, everybody, thank you for your patience. A couple of technical snafus. Um, so if you can, before we get started, take out your, uh, your, your iPhone or your cell phone or whatever and text uh, Yale Urology 870 to 22333. Just because I'm going to have a couple of questions um, during the talk. Um, it's going to get a sense of what everyone knows about pricing of stuff in the operating room. So uh, I, I gave a similar talk um, uh, a few weeks ago at another institution. And when I submitted the title of the slide, was the, the title of the talk was Supply Chain 101. The feedback I got was that no one was going to show up to the talk, and it was the most boring title that they had seen. So they made me change it. So I, this is what we're going to talk about today. It's about how we potentially could bankrupt the system if we didn't do maintenance and operating. Um, all right, so just as practice, uh, let's respond to the following statement. So it's right up. It's uh, there you go. Okay. Yeah, you're out. So some disclosures. Um, I am the what's called the lead physician advisor for our group of pros. Uh, the group of physicians are solely dealing with these types of situations. We do not have uh, large enough numbers. The goal of that is to maximize um, uh, clinical outcomes and provide a uh, competitive price for our costs and keep the price as low as possible. So this is uh, what I do for those of us in the room that are thinking about it. But an overview of the talk today, we're going to talk about what supply chain is. We're going to cover a couple of times going over a macroeconomic analysis as well, uh, about healthcare costs and how they can be impacted by some of the companies. Um, and then I'm going to make some arguments that, um, although it's not perfect, it's going to be some of the things that I think this slide are really important to drive healthcare cost growth. I'm going to introduce a healthcare company and how they can be helped in this space. I'm going to introduce what the difference between supply chain and responsibility is.
Auburn Subramanian who uh, talked about the need for uh, building up their regional economic area and the other was Peter Howard who called Congress. cost driver um, in healthcare. Um, more than 50% of cost growth is attributed to new technology, um, and that's because of surgical techniques, drugs, 
diagnostic treatment devices. This is a review article from a few years ago that's estimated the variety of different estimates, somewhere between 38 up to 75 percent of cost growth attributed to new technology. According to CMS in 2016, $1.1 trillion was spent um, uh, in the United States on hospital, um, uh, on hospital care, and that was 32 percent of national health expenditures. Um, that's increasing faster than inflation, right? Inflation is somewhere typically 2.93%. This inflation is increasing 4.7 to 5% per year, right? So it's a growing part of our economy is hospital care. Supplies and devices account for almost a third of the total cost of hospital care. But if you look at cost growth, right? So rising hospital costs, especially for surgical admissions, 36% of the average increase in cost for surgical discharge is attributed to devices, all right? It's an overall, so anyway, overall total small portion of the spend, but it's really important. Why? because it's growing, it's growing, it's growing faster than inflation is. And I would argue, and I'm gonna try to make an argument, that that growth is low value, right? So high value is you get something for your money, right? It's a good deal. Low value is you're spending money and you're not getting anything for it. And that's what I would argue is happening a lot with us in devices. So this brings up the idea of physician preference items. So what is it? People call it PPI. These are the items in the hospital for which we all have a strong preference, right? Um, and the use is determined by us. It's not alcohol prep pads, right? Alcohol prep pads are a commodity product. It's not like um, what brand of IV you use. We don't care, right? What the, the, the type of IV tubing between the IV bag and the patient's lungs. You guys don't care about it, right? It's sutures, staplers, ports, uh, the, the laparoscopic instruments you use, um, things like you know the wound closure devices. Um, it's up to 61% of supply expenditures has a really outsized impact. One example, this is not public data from the NPC, that's the GPO, that uh, the group purchasing organization that we work with here. Physician preference items are only 8% of the categories that we deal with in the NPC. It's only 12% of the contract, but it's 40% of the spend, right? So it's really significantly expensive stuff compared to the volume. Um, this is why uh, systems have reported difficulty, if not outright failure, in their attempts to tame this area of cost escalation. Um, and there's a couple reasons. One is lack of physician compliance with standardization of product usage and countervailing efforts by suppliers to influence the use of expensive devices. So value, the idea is that value is pretty elusive. Why is that? People talk about it being a function of quality and cost of care. I was really impressed the other day that um, uh, Marta Borkstrom gave a talk and she actually said it's cost and price. And it's a really important point. Cost of care do not equal price, right? We can spend a lot of time lowering our cost of care at the hospital, but the price to the, at the pump to the consumer is the same. So a lot of our, the cost improvement stuff I've worked on improve hospital margins. Right? which is good because then the hospital gets to reinvest in programs and devices and everything. But economists, especially economists at Yale, will make an argument that the only thing you're doing is making the hospital richer. You're not actually making the economy better or addressing any of your introduction. What I would say is we need two things, right? We need competition and we need cost control in the hospital to allow us to, to charge a lower price like the hospital is currently doing with radiology. Um, all right, got it. So, so, but why is improving value of physician pre preference items so difficult? I, there's four things I think that are relevant. One is that doctors don't actually know the cost of what you're using. So when you decide on something in the operating room, you're very rarely saying, oh, I'll have the two by two piece of fibrillar instead of the two by four piece of fibrillar because of the following cost concerns. Um, quality, we don't actually know the quality of the patient for what we're using, right? When you choose one laparoscopic port over another laparoscopic port and you have a strong preference for it, it's probably not because there's high quality data saying that one is better than the other. Um, I think there's also some pretty insidious influences on all of our uh, preferences for devices. And then the last thing is, even if we can try to have some good data to say that you should change the practice, it's really hard to get people to change it. Um, although there is one very effective way that we need to do that. So a little poll question here. Um, how much do you think one, this is at Yale New Haven as of yesterday, right? How much do you think one tool of Vicryl on an FKT will cost? Yeah, a single suture. Two of Vicron and FKT. All right. So this is pretty typical of what you see when you ask a question like this. It's like, what's the best amount, right? Because everything is above 50, 50, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, so barb suture. So 33 cents, $112, somewhere in between. 
I'm going to do a bunch of these. So. So a buck fourteen, that's definitely wrong. Hundred and twelve dollars, that's wrong. Alright, so what do you guys think? Percentage wise. How much better is the watch than the price? Do you think it's twenty times better? So it's twenty times higher than the average price of the watch. So these are if you look at the publication of the new watch price, you can tell that they're not a good So the outcome of the biggest How much does a bogey cost? Six and a half inch blade tip for a bogey piece is how much? Oh, I'm sorry. Twenty six dollars and twenty five cents. Of course, they're Yeah, yeah, forty. Yeah, sixty percent of the sixty percent of the price. Yeah. Um, so, how much does a bogey tip cost? A bogey cost. Seventy five cents. One hundred forty seven dollars. The device, the tip, the board, and the holder. Bogey is a six and a half inch tip. Okay, would you, if you already know that you want to bogey, would you want to bogey? Honestly, it depends. Do you have a guess what the potential that you could have? Yeah, all right. So, so 43% of you thought it was $39. You're off by a factor of 10, $3.70. So at the end of the game, when they're like, when you drop it on the, when you drop it on the floor, and someone's like, oh, wait, hey, we can open up another one. Type of question. So triple R comes in two by four and four by four sizes. How much more does it cost? There's, so obviously you want to have the size of the price you want. How much does it cost to use two two by four pieces instead of one four by four piece? So you get the same amount of triple R. In fact, you get more money. So how much more does it cost? For Dinesh and the crew, our Boston Scientific 360 Edge Machine has a massive problem. Considered estimates would be more or less than 20% of correct. So 80.5 billion. So that's the estimate of that. That's correct. Any 19th century physicians, then, that's the estimate of the 20th century. 
Position awareness of drug costs and traumatic abuse. Their median estimate is 250% of the way to the cost. Um, the consistency is also overestimated the cost of inexpensive items and underestimated the cost of expensive items. So, people with the right device cost. Prices vary from one hospital to another. This is a GAO survey of 31 different hospitals, and we're looking at the cost base for implantable devices, right? To determine the difference between the lowest and the highest reported cost. Now, on average, when you look at the 90th percentile price compared to the 10th percentile price, there's a 31% difference in price, right? So we're talking about the same device, the same difference, the exact same, right? So if you look at the range of difference between the lowest Thank you. 
Kohle von diesen gebauten Altmauern aus etwa 5000 Jahren aus der Sicht des Bischofs vor 280 Jahren als Mausoleum. think it's a great bargain when in fact it's just convenience and all we need is one person to possess the land and we wait for our time. It's the, the target relationship, right? Does that make sense? So um, what about non-disclosure? Hospitals agree to not share the contracted price with third, uh, negotiated price with third parties. Very common feature of price contracts. So um, they're, they, do they, they don't always enforce it, but in the past they have. So 2006 was a big thing about Guidant, um, where uh, Guidant, which is now owned by Boston Scientific, um, there was a company called Aspen, or a consulting firm, and they were trying to help hospitals decrease their device costs. And the way they were doing it was by educating doctors. Right? Well, that's not terrible. Um, and so Guidant, um, Guidant sued Aspen, the consulting company, um, for committing interference with their contracts when it collected and compared product prices from different vendors to help ho hospitals economize. Literally, just for helping them understand what they were paying and what other people were paying. Um, and so this is the, the point I, uh, of this article I think is really important. They say, once physicians agree to help hospitals push for lower prices, vendors become right. right? And the only, thing the only thing Aspen was doing was transparent. They were giving people price information. So. What did this lead to? So 2007, a year later, um, a, uh, the Transparency and Medical Device Pricing Act of 2007 was proposed, and they targeted non-disclosure. And they said, all right, we're going to create a public registry that says sales price net of discounts, rebates, all that other stuff. We're going to distill it down, and we're going to create a public registry of what people are paying for devices. Simple. Right? So like when you shop on Amazon, and you can see 20 different prices for the same item, right? Same idea. Makes a ton of sense, would be great for hospitals, reduces the amount of money we have to spend trying to figure out how much stuff costs. So of course, it was so logical, um, so rational that it didn't pass. Um, and also because the device and drug companies have very significant departments. So Leslie, this gets at your question. There's this concept of something called a confusopoly, which actually, believe it or not, it's like a, an, economy, an economic term, um, but it also came from a Dilbert cartoon. Um, but it's a, a group of companies with similar products, and their goal is to intentionally confuse customers instead of competing on price. So the classic example is cell phone com companies, right? If you go to a variety of different, uh, like um, you know, Verizon, AT&T, you try to compare what you're getting. The phones, you may be able to judge that the phone is the same, but the contracts are totally crazy. Some have rollover minutes, some don't have rollover minutes, some have like uh, minutes you can share with someone else, free texting, free, it's impossible to compare what you're getting, right? Um, and that means it's impossible for the consumer to determine which is the best deal. If you can't determine which one's the best deal, then you can't make a decision on price. If you can't make a decision on price, market forces won't select for lower prices. So what happens? People start to choose based on non-value factors. So if you go to these websites now, I don't know if you have recently, there's like branded phones. So you can get like your Gucci phone or you can get your other phone. People start choosing based on things that don't bring real value. So what I wonder, is physician preference one of those non-value factors, right? So when we all say, and I'm on calls with people about heart, heart, heart stents and things like that, and they say, but I prefer this one. Is that like saying, but I like that idea of the Gucci phone, right? It makes me feel good. So when you talk to them on the phone, people, I, I, I lead these conference calls about like 
contracts and purchasing things. And the, I hear a lot of physicians appeal to quality. And they'll say things like, well, but costs aren't my responsibility as a physician. I consider outcomes. I choose what's best for my patients. And then the worst is when they just say, flat out say, but this is what I prefer, right? But oftentimes they're appealing to quality. Costs, forget it. I do things that's best for my patients. And it's easy to make that argument. actually not quality because there's very little comparative data for devices, right? Devices can get approved by the FDA and inspect without it. So uh, a GAO study, the Government Accountability Office, said only 79% um, of class three, those are the highest risk devices, only 79% underwent their process what's called pre-market approval. PMA is like the most rigorous process that the FDA has for devices. Um, even though it's the most rigorous, it's still really weak. All they have to show is a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness have just one clinical trial to get FDA approval, and there's very few of them are randomized, controlled, or blind. Yeah. And is there a recent backlash to get the use of the PMA system that has started to get the use of the device in the United States? Is there some kind of failure to get that used by the FDA? Yeah. Like, for example, the NEC, the oral HPV pill, we have NEC, and that case just happened with the whole machine. Yeah, I mean, so after, aftermarket surveillance is really important. There's a, there's a group here um, that's working on that that we're, we're trying to uh, get involved with. So, but if they don't go through PMA, they go through something called the 510K pathway. And this is a real problem. Um, it's a really low hurdle. All they say is you have to have a substantially equivalent to previously cleared devices, right? Um, you don't need any direct evidence of safety. You don't need any uh, evidence of effectiveness. And only 10 to 15% of these 510K pathway submissions have any clinical data. So here's an example. This is, if you guys haven't seen this, I think it's fascinating. Um, 2013, New England Journal, there's this report of this Depew um, acetabular cup system, a HIP. It was cleared by the FDA in 2008, went through the 510K pathway, um, and the clearance was based on this idea of substantial equivalence, five decades of implants, 95 different devices, 52 different acetabular components, right? So they cobble together this like Frankenstein of a HIP implant, they don't have really, there's no clinical data and it gets FDA approval, gets marketed and only in aftermarket surveillance did they find out that the revision rate was fourfold higher than other implants what was felt to be acceptable and two years later it gets pulled off the market. One of, the, one, of the things I think is, um, I, one of the things I think is fascinating is that they say when they're going to tell the FDA, this is substantially equivalent. But when they come to your operating room, this is dramatically new and different and it's going to really make a difference. So, um, so uh, you guys are all aware of this stuff that right, even when there is evidence, it's often wrong. Um, John Ioannidis uh, even when, uh, has written a lot about um, that published research is often false. Um, and says that 80% of non-randomized studies and kind of studies that, that the FDA is okay with, 25% of gold standard randomized trials are just wrong. Um, and he has a couple corollaries of why he thinks this is. And if you read through the corollaries, it sounds like a heck of a lot like most of the studies that you look at. The smaller the studies, the smaller the studies are, um, the less likely the research findings are to be true. The greater the financial and other interests and prejudices in a scientific field, the less likely the research findings are to be true. It sounds like every device study you ever look at. Um, this is a really interesting paper from, uh, from him in two, uh, 2005 in JAMA. It looked at original research published in like gold standard journals, uh, New England Journal, Lancet, and JAMA. 
um, or other high impact facts or specialty journals that have been cited more than a thousand times, right? So high impact research, 49 papers, 45 of them said that the intervention they studied was effective. A quarter of them had never um, been challenged or validation attempted. And a third of them were contradicted or had effects stronger than subsequent studies. So the conclusion really is even the best research stuff cited more than a thousand times at JAMA, New England Journal, um, and The Lancet is often wrong. If you, I don't know if you guys have seen this, it made, it made a big splash uh, when it was first published in 2016. It was cited in the AP published two different times. This is a data set, one data set, and they asked the question, um, does uh, use of red cards in soccer, is that, is that associated with the skin color of the soccer player who uses the red card? Okay. They had a data set and they gave it to 29 different sets of researchers and they came up with 29 different answers. So nine teams, found, nine teams of researchers found no association between skin color and red card. 20 teams found an association with an odds ratio of around 1.3 but there's really wide variations. Some saw a really small, uh, non-significant impact. Some saw a statistically significant, large impact. Same data set, 29 different teams, 29 different answers. So leads to the question, is there a reproducibility crisis? A survey published in Nature, 90% of researchers feel that there's a reproducibility crisis. So when we talk about the value equation and we talk about quality and all of the things on the numerator, it's very hard for us as clinicians to actually trust the data and to actually know what's real. So even when there's good evidence, when there's guidelines, clinical care doesn't follow it. Only 55% of recommended care is actually received according to this study. And so why? Physician autonomy, skepticism regarding the evidence basis, refusal of standardized processes kind of produces this mix that creates this physician preference item morass, and it leaves room for insidious influence. So what are those influences on, your, on all of our preferences? One is money. So um, you guys are all, I think, familiar with this. Gene Mitchell's um, editorial um, or uh, paper in the, in the New England Journal. Um, we looked at two groups, self-urologists that, uh, uh, that owned IMRT and those that don't. Look at the pre-ownership period, use of IMRT is the same. After a group gets IMRT, their use of IMRT skyrockets, right? Why? Because it's financially successful. It's financially a good thing for them. We're not the only ones. This is orthopedic surgeons. Um, in 2007, so in 2007, more than uh, about $200 million was, was, was given to um, five different joint manufacturers, um, which influenced people's decision making in the Department of Justice then um, you know, came down on the joint manufacturers. And this is one of the things that led uh, to the Sunshine Act. Um, and the CMS uh, open payment site. So in 2017, okay. so all right, so 2017, $8.4 billion was paid by industry to physicians and hospitals. 11 and a half million payments, 1,500 companies, more than 600,000 physicians in the United States took money. So $8.4 billion, sounds like a lot of money, but it's hard to kind of put it into perspective, so let's try to. Major League Baseball salaries in 2018. Total, every baseball, Major League Baseball player. Anyone want to guess? 3.9 billion. So you could double the salary of every Major League Baseball player and still have $600 million left over. The other Havens Health System's revenue in 2017. So this is, we have 2 million employees. 130,000 discharges, sorry, uh, 25,000 employees, 2 million outpatient encounters, 130,000 discharges. What's our revenue? $4.3 billion, less, about, you know, less than half. How about Chipotle, Taco Bell, Panera? Combine their revenue. $8.6 billion in 2016. That is a lot of sandwiches and chalupas. Um, if you stack $1 bills, goes 570 miles in the air, goes past the stage ta space station twice. Spend 20 bucks a second, $20 a second. It'll take you more than 13 years to spend all the money that industry is giving to the physicians in this country. So how about if there were, if this was a GDP of a country, we've been talking about GDP, that would exceed the GDP of 50 countries in the, in the world. All right. So the point I'm trying to make is it's a lot of money. Why does industry do it? Because they get something for it, right? What do they get? They get your preferences and your preferences are worth more than that. So uh, in Connecticut, the median payment is 160 bucks, the mean payment of $3,200. And you don't have to look very hard at Yale to see people taking 
hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? So there are people at Yale who take more from industry than anyone in this room gets paid. Yeah. The payments increase the institution's net worth. You have to break it down. There's a way to break it down. Yep. Yep. So you can't just look at the lump sum that's Why? Lump sum. So if you get if you get if, if an orthopedic surgeon gets fifty thousand dollars for a research or education fund, do you think that has any influence on them? Sure. Okay. Well, so I think this is black and white. I'm just no, saying how much. That number, the total number. So I'm saying that data that you're saying more granular. That data on that map includes the lump sum. The broken up. That's all I'm saying. This is a lump sum, but what? But I guess I think we'll. But what I'm saying is. You can, you can, you guys can all decide whether or not what the money is used for matters. Well, if you get a, if you get a big grant that provides salary support, it may not provide salary support for you. You don't need those jobs. Or your lab. Or the lab, right? Right. So. Come to your pocket. But. Does it have to? And so, so, so what I'm saying, so the only thing I can tell you, is I'm, I'll show you some. We'll, we'll go through some data. And you can make an argument about what causes influence or not. I would argue that if so, maybe you know, um, maybe support from industry, support from industry that keeps your career going, right? That keeps your lab going, that that helps you publish. It's the currency of an academic career may have just as much influence on your prescribing patterns as the twenty dollar ham sandwich, right? So this is this is a um, this is a study uh, from JAMA Internal Medicine that looked at pharmacy visits um, and association between. Um, uh, people prescribing these very expensive Me Too drugs, right? And this is days with sponsored meals on the x-axis, and the y-axis is your prescribing to these Me Too drugs, right? And there's a dose response. The more meals they give you, the, the more meals they give you, the more likely you are to prescribe, right? The sad thing is, average payment, less than 20 bucks, right? It's a ham sandwich. So we're not very expensive. So my argument is it's maybe not necessarily the, 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 the visit, um, it's, it's not necessarily the meal, it's not the ham sandwich, it's not the money, it's the face time with you that changes your, your practice pattern. So this is, I think, a uh, really eye-opening um, descriptive paper um, it, uh, from a couple years ago. What I would say is people make lots of statements about why a device rep needs to be in the operating room or in the hospital. Provision of service, we trust them, easing clinical <laughs> care, CME. You gotta remember the primary goal of why they're there is to sell people. This is, these are quotes from device reps. Once surgeons get used to using a Ferrari, they always want to drive the Ferrari. The surgeon isn't paying for it, the hospital is. It starts spiraling out of control. What I see is a big issue, this is a device rep, is surgeons being able to say no for 90% of my fractures, the $300 device will be fine instead of the $3,000 device. We used to sell an implant that has 99% survivorship at 15 years, which is great, right? We were told not to ever market, to, market it to anyone. If a doctor asked for it by name, we would give it to them. Uh, we want to market the newer, better technology. I'm not certain I ever thought the newer technology was better. There certainly wasn't any data on it. I was uncomfortable with those sorts of things. Um, so, I, I, so I tell the surgeon, just so you know, I noticed the patient was young, so we also ordered ceramic heads. Coefficient of friction is lower, should make the part last longer. I don't know if that's true or not. There was never a situation when I thought, I know this is inferior, I'm going to sell it anyway. It was more like, I don't think this is any better, but I know it's more expensive, so I'm going to sell it. So it's not just utilization, right? It's not just what you decide to use. It's the fact that they split us, right? So you, they develop preferences with other people. You have preferences for different companies. That leads to uh, changing cost, right? Because when we can't contract because people have preferences for three different device manufacturers, you can't bulk purchase, right? And so that leads to higher prices across the board. So here's a question for you. In the past year, other than meeting, have you had any contact with Yale New Haven supply chain? A value analysis nurse, materials management, someone from contracting, someone that you knew was from Yale New Haven Supply Chain. I know a couple of you have. Put on us, no one's asking us, asking me, like, 
don't know if they're good or bad, yep. but it seems that if you want to reduce costs, you need to build a model. It's got a small net worth. People are saying, okay, this is the, you know, you've done all the hard work here. Find, you know, the, the common denominator, and so it does these things. I think it's a great idea, and we're trying to do a lot of that. We have a, something called the Clinical Governance Committee that works on that stuff, but people do, you, you may not submit requests for new technology, but, but doctors do it all the time. We get dozens of requests for this. Um, all right. For the only other pitch I would say is it is such a slope because once in a while there will be some new technology that might be really good. Yep. And dumb down the hill. So, you know, it's like giving extra lipid managers easy fees for a little fast food bike. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, that kind of stuff. Right. But so I would argue, though, that sales visits um, don't don't uh, lead to innovation, right? They lead to you paying, us paying more for the bike. So there's opportunity for innovation and collaboration there between Visa and other things that, you know, vendor fairs, something else that's more efficient. So have you had any contact with a device rep, right? So if 85% of us had no contact with our own supply chain people who are procuring stuff, but most of us have had contact with them who are far better than we are in tech communication. So there's something called the tyranny of small decisions. Right? So there's um, the, the, the most common example of this is, um, is uh, called the tragedy of the commons. And the idea is that common grazing ground, right? And there's like 10 different farmers that want to use it. The individual's, uh, the individual's desire is to take their sheep, go to the grazing ground and have them eat as much of the grass as possible, get a competitive advantage over the nine other sheep, right? So everybody does that. And the, the grass all gets eaten by the roots, nothing else grows, all the sheep die, right? So this is when a multitude of small, Individually rational decisions cumulatively result, cumulatively result in a suboptimal or undesired outcome. Things like votes per, right? Like the interest spending going up, like major healthcare program spending going up. Um, Dart this is a, just an example from a hospital that's part of the NPC. Two years ago, Dartmouth Hitchcock recorded um, a $39 million operating loss that they attributed to growth in expenses. And if you look at this, is I, um, I actually I presented this to them. They were I don't think too excited about it. So 2016 compared to 2015, right? Um, they spent $219 million in 2016 on medical supplies and medications. They spent $90 million more in 2015. And the question I asked them was, do you think your care was $90 million better or $90 more million of medical supply and device care? Is it better in 2016? Or could you have lowered that amount by maybe 10, 12 percent? And the people in the audience said, yeah, I think we probably could have lowered it by 10 or 12 percent. That would have made up their operating costs. But what does the what does their health system do instead? What's the other big major cost? Labor, right? The salary, revenue generation, cost. So the upshot: PPI is challenging. Costs are opaque. There's a morass of weak data. Much of it's not reproducible. We're slow to adapt practice changes unless there's something in it for us. The influence of industry and physician on, uh, on physician preferences is pretty significant. So what are our lessons? And the, the things I'm hoping to work on over in supply chain, I want to educate providers about costs. A lot of these are the ideas that you guys propose. Um, put them in context. Physicians have to recognize the limitations of the evidence. We have to remain skeptical about the incremental benefits of devices. I think we need to understand a potential conflict of interest that the hospital has and that physicians have. And I think we have to work together. There's got to be collaboration. We can't have everybody speaking to industry and no one speaking to supply chain. And I think we really need to, as, as uh, Matt, you were pointing out, we need to align the interests of patients, providers, and supply chain through things like shared value programs. So this is a study uh, in JAMA, simple thing. UCSF said, hey, listen, we're going to just do trans price transparency. Surgeons, uh, we're going to divide the department into two groups. Everyone gets a bonus if you can save money in the operating room. But one group, uh, one the intervention arm, got data about how much they were spending. So. The median um, surgical supply direct costs decreased in the intervention arm. So if you give people data, their costs go down. And the other group, their costs increased 7.4% compared to the inflation that we just did. All right. So one last question. What most closely approximates your thoughts? You already use the cheapest devices available? Or are you willing to change some products or vendors to reduce costs but need help to do it? Or do you think the hospital should be willing to pay higher costs for devices you prefer? even if no outcomes data demonstrate superiority? Or do you think that doctors should never consider costs? Supply chain's job is to procure what I want. There's obviously other options. All right. 
What I, one of the kind of a parting thought. Anyone heard of this guy, Leonid Ragozov, Russian surgeon? I think we have all gotten really used to the idea of using expensive devices and um, caring about really fine minutia. Ragozov was a Russian surgeon, went to Antarctica on a mission. They were in the middle of nowhere. He was the only doctor there, a small little like Russian base. Two weeks after he arrived, he gets abdominal pain and diagnoses himself, obviously without imaging, diagnoses himself with appendicitis, realizes that unless he intervenes, he thinks he's going to die, right? So some people would argue now you can give antibiotics, but he thinks he's going to, you know, he need, needs an appendectomy. So what does he do? Wide awake, does his own appendectomy in Antarctica, you know, no imaging, like no uh, ligature, none of these other things. Two weeks later, he's back at work, right? So if you looked at objective outcome metrics, right? So relatively short convalescence, did well, recovered well, no readmission. You look at all those things. What would, what's the benefit of adding extra devices? My guess is his appendectomy was relatively cost effective. The other thing is that um, you gotta remember that it's your skills, right? It's the stuff that you guys know, the things that you, your decision-making and your surgical skills that save lives, it's not the devices. This is a picture of a, uh, surg uh, the tools that someone used to do a surgical airway out on the field. They had a water bottle, a, um, a pocket knife, and a pen. They did a surgical airway and saved a patient's life, right? So what's the measurable outcome benefit that an ET tube would have done for that, right? Not much. You're not a commodity, but most of the devices you use are. That's the thought. All right. Um, so it depends. On, so it depends on the on the contract, um, and the, but there have been there have been um, hospitals that have been sued by um, poor disclosure um, by uh, companies for disclosing price of disclosing what that. But that's not the case here. I mean, you can you can get it. Yeah, just like we just did. But we can't display it. We can't display prices in the core or anything because there are other drugs.